it's hard to prove things in science, which is why I personally really love maths. I love maths because it's something that can easily be proven. In America, they call it math. In Australia, we call it maths. I don't know why, maybe we can't count. But I really love maths. It's easy to prove. Two plus two, you can prove that it equals four. I once memorized pi to 446 decimal places, just for fun. That, that's how much I love maths. When I first went to Monash University, as those who came to our previous presentations would have heard that I, I studied at Monash University, they told us something very interesting. They told us that you cannot prove anything. Now, remember when he first told me that you can't prove anything, I was like, that's a weird thing to say. And he said, he went then to say, if you were to say, I can prove that I exist, I can prove that I'm here in front of you. He said, well, I could offer an alternative hypothesis. I could say that you've, had, you've inhaled too much carbon monoxide and you're in fact in a hospital somewhere in Ballarat. You're just hallucinating that you're here. They tell us that we can't prove anything. And this is an idea that's common in the world around us today. In fact, if you look at uh, an article in the Scientific American, it says common misconceptions about science. Number one, scientific proof. Why there's no such thing as scientific proof. Another article that I found in Psychology Today said, I'm a scientist and I don't believe in facts. The benefits of a post-truth society. We live in a society where truth is relative. We're told, ah, oh, the truth depends on your perspective. We are steering away from absolute truth and moving into the idea of things that are relative to each one of us. For example, an image like this is often shown to us and said, do you see, from both of these people's perspective, they are telling the truth. There is no such thing as absolute truth. And I would like to say that I think that that is ridiculous. I believe that there are things as absolute proof. For example, in this image, the person who, have, who would have written that number would have had a number in mind, and that would have been the truth. Now, whether one or neither of these people know what that is, it doesn't mean that there isn't an absolute truth. Another image that it's often shown in psychology classes and so forth is this image, where we're told, do you see, truth is relative. All these three elements are true. I'd like to state that that is also ridiculous. Only one of these is true, and it is the cylinder. The other two are misrepresentations of the truth, highly biased misrepresentations of the truth. If you look just from this angle, you may be able to see the cylinder as appearing to be a square, but it's not the truth. There is an absolute truth. However, this isn't what we're told today. So when we look at the idea of Jesus and the idea of did Jesus exist, well, we're told, ah, well, you see, this depends on your interpretation of the facts. This depends on how you look at the data. I would like to state that whether or not Jesus existed has nothing to do with the way you interpret the facts. Whether or not Jesus existed only has to do with whether or not Jesus existed. The way you interpret this data only has to do with how you will perceive whether he existed or not. So how do we know anything about history? How do we look and find out whether people existed or not? Well, the first way that we could do this is by looking at archaeological evidence. One may do a dig and they might find a house. And in this house, they might find some carpenter's tools. And from these, they may deduce that either a carpenter lived here or maybe someone who made carpenter's tools lived in this house. Another way that we discover things about history is through a oral history. Ideas that are passed down through generations and this way we're told about this is how we discover things about history one of the ways you'll be interested to know that 
in almost all civilizations, there is an account of the biblical flood story in almost every single civilization today. However, oral history, uh, history passed down orally has some problems associated with it. As have any of you know of the game Chinese Whispers? I see some people nodding their heads. So it's when you tell someone next to you something and they need to tell the person there and so forth until it gets 20 people down the road. And we actually uh, played this uh, uh, probably about 2006. And it went through about 20 people. And when it got to the end, it was a completely different story than, than when it started. Now, yes, exaggerated. Sometimes there's, there's a smart aleck in the middle who completely changes the story. But oral traditions are a way that we look into history. But a much more reliable way is manuscripts. We look at and see what does the manuscript evidence tell us? What does the manuscripts that we see today tell us about what happened in the past? And the way that we investigate these manuscripts is by first looking, how many of them are there? How many manuscripts do we have that are telling us something? All manuscripts, all literary manuscripts that we have are copies of copies. We don't have any original literary documents. The only original documents that we have are things like personal letters and bills of sale and things like that. But no literary manuscripts do we have the original. We only have copies of copies of copies. So we first look at how many do we find? And then we compare them. We look at how does this one compare with this one? This is sometimes referred to as textual criticism. And the third thing that we do is we look at when was the document discovered? Was the dis uh, how far was there between when the document was written and when the earliest known copy was discovered? So let's have a look at Plato, for example. Plato lived between the 5th and 4th century BC. And um, Plato gave us a, a number of works. One is called Phaedo. Uh, which means on the soul. And this has shaped humanity's view on the afterlife. And we'll actually be looking a little bit into this document in one of our later talks, I believe two Sundays from now. But Plato has given us a, a number of quotes. One of them is, wise men speak because they have something to say, fools because they have to say something. Does anyone here know someone like that? Please don't, don't point, don't point. Another thing that Plato has said is, if you don't take an interest in the affairs of your government, then you are doomed to live under the rule of fools. And I have to admit, I haven't paid much interest into the affairs of our government. Maybe I should start looking more into it. How many of Plato's documents do we have? We have around 250 manuscripts from Plato. And the time between when the earliest known copy was found to, from when it was written is around 1100 years. Yet, no credible historian denies the existence of Plato. It's actually interesting that Socrates, who was Plato's teacher, he hasn't given us any documents. We don't have any documents from Socrates. However, no credible historian will deny his existence. Let's look at Aristotle, for example. Aristotle was Plato's pupil. Aristotle actually taught Alexander the Great, who we found out in our first presentation that he conquered the, no, the then known world in just under 10 years, extremely fast. Now, Aristotle also gave us a, a number of quotes. This is one of my favorites from him. He says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. I really like this. We aren't the things that we occasionally do, the occasional good acts that we do. That doesn't define us. What defines us is what we repeatedly do. Our habits define us. Another thing that Aristotle wrote is there is no great genius without a mixture of madness. Now, I don't know if, if he was speaking about himself or, or what he was saying here. But how many documents from Aristotle do we have? Well, we have 49 documents from him. And the year between when the first was written to the first earliest known copy was 
1,400 years. So, what about the Bible? I looked and I, I discovered that around 40% of people who did this survey in London claim that they do not believe that Jesus was a historical figure. They don't believe that Jesus existed. So let's have a look at the manuscript evidence. How many manuscripts from the New Testament do we have? Well, in Greek, we have 5,800. In Latin, we have over 10,000 documents. In other languages, we have another 9,300. That's a whooping 25,000 manuscripts of the Bible. Now compare this with Aristotle who had 49. That's over 500 times as many. Now what about the time from when the earliest copy was found to when it was written? Now for that we need to look at a document called P52. P52 is a, uh, a fragment of the book of John. In fact I have here a replica of P52. It's not the original there, wouldn't let me bring the original. It's, it's a replica. And it actually sits kind of like this. It's written on, on both sides. And this document was purchased by a gentleman called Dr. Greenfield in 1920. And he bought this for his university in Manchester. And they looked, actually they left it in the library for about 14 years. And then one of the pupils picked it up and had a look at it and realized that this is an early copy of the book of John. It has a, a fragment in it from John chapter 18. So he sent this to some of the local professors, to the leading experts in dating at the time. And they sent him back the data. Now, the book of John is believed to have been written around 90 AD. So, this fragment of the text was dated, three of, the, three of the four people said that it was between 100 and 150 AD. The other person said that it was between 90 and 100 AD. So, essentially, what these people were saying is that between when the original was written, and the earliest known copy is somewhere between 1 and 60 years. Now, if we compare this with what Aristotle is 1400 years. We compare this with Plato, it's 1100 years. This suggests that the Bible is, the, the documents for the Bible are far more credible than they are. But the place and time that these documents were written also goes towards how credible they are. You see, if you were to write a lie and try to, to sell a lie to someone, for example, if I was to say the people of Maryborough are really evil, cruel people, they have a guillotine next to the train station where they execute shoplifters. Right? If I was to try to sell this lie, would I get very far if I tried to sell this here in Maryborough? People in Maryborough know that there's no guillotine at the train station. If I wanted to sell this lie, I maybe do it better if I was, for example, to try take it to North Korea. Then it would be more likely to sell. Now, the fact that the books of the Bible were written very close to where the events happened made them easily verifiable. And not only that, but they were written within a very short time after Jesus went to heaven. The people were still alive who had seen Jesus personally. Imagine that someone would have, would have gone to a church and they're reading John chapter 11 about how Lazarus was raised from the dead. And one of them in the church said, oh yes, my brother witnessed this. This is true. Now, while there is compelling evidence that... New Testament accounts are true and accurate. This evidence is highly biased. People say to me, yes, Marius, I, I see that there's over 25,000 manuscripts, very short time between when they were written and when they were discovered, but it's all highly biased. Imagine that I had been picked up by the police and they threw me in the back of a divvy van 
I don't need to imagine, it's happened once before. We won't go into that now though. And they accused me of something horrible. They accused me of murder. So they went to my wife and they asked, where was Marius last Sunday between seven and eight? And she would say to them, oh, he was in Maryborough doing a Revelation Today series. Would this be credible evidence on my behalf? I see someone shaking their head. It would be some evidence, but not, yeah, not, not enough. My, my wife would be highly biased towards my freedom, or at least you'd hope that she'd be highly biased towards my freedom. Now, what if they were then to ask my parents, where was Marius last Sunday? And my parents were to say, oh yes, he was in Maryborough. Would this corroborate that evidence? Yeah, some. A little more, but still, all these people are highly biased towards my freedom. What about if they were to go to one of my enemies? I don't have any enemies that I know of, I think I've got rid of them all. But imagine that they've found one of my enemies. And they go and they ask him, where was Marius on Sunday between 7 and 8? And my enemy said, he was in Maryborough. Would this be credible evidence? Well, I believe that this would much more support because he would have no interest, he or she would have no interest to lie on my behalf. If anything, they would have more interest to say something against me. Is there any of this kind of evidence for the New Testament? Is there any kind of evidence where people who are biased against Christians support biblical accounts? And the answer to that question is, yes, there is a lot of evidence of this kind. One of my favorites is Tacitus. Tacitus was a famous Roman historian who lived between 56 and 120 AD. He would have been alive in the same lifetime as many who would have seen Jesus face to face. And he gives us an interesting document where he's speaking about Nero. Now, Nero is believed to have started a, a fire in Rome and then blamed the Christians. And he writes about this. He says, Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called the Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. A most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of their world find their center and become popular. I like that last part. All things shameful become popular in Rome, according to Tacitus. Now, Let's have a look. How did Tacitus feel about the Christians? Well, he refers to them as a class hated for their abominations. He also refers to them as having a most mischievous superstition and the source of the evil. Obviously, Tacitus doesn't like the Christians one bit. But Tacitus confirms a number of things that have happened in the Bible. In fact, he confirms five things. Firstly, he confirms that there was a group called the Christians. He confirms that this group had their origin with Christ. He further confirms that Christ suffered the extreme penalty, which for Romans was, of course, crucifixion. He also confirms that this happened during the reign of Tiberius. And he further confirms that this happened at the hands of one of the procurators, Pontius Pilate. So here we have Tacitus, someone who has no interest in the Christians. In fact, he, he hates the Christians. He confirms a number of biblical accounts, and he's not the only one. We have another nine people that are not Christians and that are not favorable towards Christians. Two of them are not antagonistic towards Christians, they're kind of neutral. But seven of them are actually highly biased against Christians. And they confirm evidence that we find in the Bible. 
It's no wonder that famous historian uh, Michael Grant writes, in recent years, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few. And they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant evidence to the contrary. Now, Michael Grant died just a couple of years back, but he was a well-known historian and classicist. He was very interested in, in the first century AD. Now, you may say, all right, Marius, I see that there is compelling evidence um, of, of the New Testament manuscripts. There's over 25,000 copies, very short time between the earliest known copy and when, and when it was written. And even the people that dislike Christianity, even they confirm it. But what if Jesus was just a man? Have you ever had anyone say to you, oh, Jesus was just a man? I see some people nodding their heads. I've, I've had many people say this to me. Many people say, oh yes, he was a, he was a nice man. He was a good and, and kind rabbi. Is it possible that Jesus was just a man? Who of us here know who this is? This is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis gave us a number of writings. One of his most famous is the Chronicles of Narnia. And he writes an interesting statement. He says that a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman, or something worse. Essentially, what C.S. Lewis is saying is that the kinds of things that Jesus said could only be said by one of three options. Either they were said by the Son of God, as Jesus claimed, or they were said by someone who was delusional and thought he was the Son of God, or they were said by someone who was deliberately setting out to deceive the people around him. So what kinds of things did Jesus say so C.S. Lewis says this about him? Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Imagine that I came to you and said, I am the light of the world. What would you think? You'd be like, yes, officer, he claims to be the light of the world, right? What about if I said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What if, if a man came up to you and said, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What about this one? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus also said, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, what the Jews would have immediately recognized that Jesus was claiming to be the same Jehovah God who spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So, if a man came and said to you, I am the light of the world, or I am Jehovah God, well, he'd be crazy, right? Or he would be <laughs> deliberately trying to lie to you. Now, people say, oh yes, he was just a man. You see, he didn't actually die on the cross. He just fainted on the cross. This is sometimes referred to as the swoon theory. Swoon meaning to, to faint or to pass out. Some people say, oh, Jesus just fainted. He didn't really die and therefore he didn't really raise from the dead because they put him in the grave and then he came to a few days later and people thought he came back from the dead. Is this something that's possible? Well, let's have a look at the evidence. The people who were ordered to execute Jesus were Roman soldiers. They were trained executioners. But more than that, they had to make sure that their victim was dead because if the victim escaped alive, they would themselves be put to death. 
So let's have a look at, at, at what happened during Jesus' crucifixion. We have an interesting verse in John chapter 19, verse 34 and 35, which reads, But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing forth a flow of blood and water. So what's going on here? Well, the time of Jesus' crucifixion was just before the Passover. Now, this was a time of uh, festivity and celebration all throughout Jerusalem. In fact, thousands of Jews came to Jerusalem for this celebration. And the, the Jews thought, no, we don't want to see people being crucified during this time. So they went to Pilate and they said, can we just kill them? We, we don't want this to intrude on our celebrations. And Pilate said, okay, go and break their legs. Now what this would do, as one was crucified, in order for them to exhale, they would need to push on the nail that was nailed into their feet. And that way they were able to exhale and draw another breath. Now when one was, uh, when they broke their legs, this made them not be able to push up anymore and they would asphyxiate. So, as the soldiers came up to Jesus, they didn't break his legs because they found him already dead. Now, notice what the soldiers didn't do. The soldiers didn't go up to Jesus and like, oh yeah, he appears to be dead. Let's go to Maccas. Right? No, they, they said, oh, he appears to be dead. Let's make sure that he is dead. And they got a spear and they pierced it into his side, through his lungs, and quite possibly into his heart. And then something interesting happened. It says that there was a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, crucifixion typically resulted in death in one of two ways. The first way is by hypervolemic shock which simply means too much blood loss and the, the body doesn't have enough blood to pump around. The other more common way was by asphyxiation. And both of these ways of death would result in a decreased oxygen in the body. Now, when the body has a decreased oxygen in it, what it often does to try to combat this is to push out fluid from the vessels into the capillaries, into the surrounding tissue as to concentrate the blood. And this results in a condition called pericardial effusion, which means water around the heart, and pleural oedema, which means water around the lungs. So when the soldiers stabbed Jesus, they saw blood and water come out. Now they wouldn't have had these fancy terms like we have today, but they would have known when someone is crucified and has died and we stab them in the lungs and quite possibly into the heart, then we expect blood and water to come out. And this way, they would have been absolutely convinced that Jesus was dead. And some people say, Jesus most definitely died on the cross. But is it possible that he remained dead? Is it possible that Jesus never rose from the grave? Is it possible that his disciples stole his body away? It's important to know when trying to answer this question that the Jews were afraid that this would happen. And they spoke to Pilate and they asked him, can you give us someone to guard the tomb? We don't want them to steal Jesus' body. And Pilate said to them, take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. A Roman guard typically consisted of a 16-man unit. Each one of these men were in charge of an area of six square feet. That's just under one square meter. If one of these guards fell asleep, he would be burned to death in his own, with his own clothes. But not just that, 
he would not be the only one who was put to death. The entire 16-man unit would be put to death if only one of the soldiers fell asleep. They had every incentive to make sure that none of them fall asleep and that they are guarding the, the tomb as best as they can. Is it possible that Jesus' body was stolen? No, most definitely not. In fact, Paul writes about this and he says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people are to be the most pitied. Paul realized, as would have the disciples, that Jesus' resurrection was the critical point of Christianity. And for me, one of the best arguments that Jesus did in fact raise from the dead was what happened to the disciples. Did you know that all of the disciples, with the exception of John, were martyred because of their beliefs? They tried to kill John, but they, they weren't able to. But all of them were martyred because of their faith. I believe that this is extremely good evidence for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if he hadn't, who would give their life for a lie? Imagine when the executioner is telling them to confess or die. You'd confess. But if you knew that Jesus raised from the dead, then you would have no fear of death. Then you would know that his promises are valid for you and that he will raise you from the dead as well. There is compelling evidence of Jesus' existence. There is over 25,000 manuscripts, a time of only one to 60 years between the earliest known copy and when it was written. Even people antagonistic towards Christianity confirms events in the New Testament. Jesus didn't leave us the option to believe that he was just a man. He most definitely died on the cross and he most definitely rose from the grave. With all this compelling evidence, what remains is, what will you choose? You see, the Bible tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good. As some of you here know, before I came, before I gave my life to God, I was stuck in a world of drug abuse. I was stuck in a world of alcohol abuse. I was one of those people that you look at and you have heaps of pity on because you see that they're just so stuck. They're never going to get out of here. In fact, my father tells me that at one stage he, he said to himself, if Marius dies, well then, then he dies. There's just no more that I can do for him. And one day, I decided to put God to the test. I decided to taste and see if the Lord is good. And that day, my life changed. As we've seen in the last three presentations, there is compelling evidence in prophecy. There is compelling evidence in science. There is compelling evidence in history. All that remains is the choice that you will make. So I invite you today, what choice will you make? Will you taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself? I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'd just like to close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the compelling historical evidence that there is, Lord, for the existence of Jesus and for the price that he paid for us, Lord. Father, we want to praise your name for this, Lord, not just now, but throughout eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.